Well, welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 2. We're going to be talking about the famous Christian story or Christmas story, the Christmas narrative, and also Jesus being dedicated in the temple and also the boy Jesus. So this is a very interesting uh, chapter. Uh, we see nothing uh, like it in any of the other Gospels in its details about the baby and the birth and the boy. Let's talk about, uh, let's read Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. In some translations, it is talking about a census, that all the world should be uh, made to come in and, and enroll in a census. Now, here is a good example of how we have in certain portions of scripture, including, let's say, for example, example uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, John 3, 16, the famous John 3, 16. When it says the world, it doesn't mean the whole wide world and everybody in it, okay? There's a specific kind of world it's talking about, okay? Or it's talking about generically speaking, okay? Not talking about every single person that's alive. Here is a good example of that. It says here that Caesar Augustus uh, commanded that the whole world would be enrolled, or would be uh, involved in, in uh, taking of a census. That doesn't mean that the Aztecs, that the, um, that the natives of North America, that uh, you know, people in uh, Australia, uh, people in the Eastern continent, doesn't mean that everybody everywhere came to, to, to Caesar Augustus at that time to take a census. No, of course not. You know, in, uh, in context, it's talking about generically speaking the whole world or more or less just the people in that area. So again, so many Christians they 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 take world they take words like the world and they make it sound like it means everybody everywhere like it's the world, where it doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, we see in the Hebrew text, you know, there are points uh, different parts of the Hebrew text where it says world or earth, and literally in the Hebrew it's haaretz, which means land. It's not. Ha'olam, which means, as we would say, world today. It's not the whole world, but more like more like Ha'aretz, the land, or that particular area, region, or, you know, in a generic sense, as in John 3.16, meaning people from all different races, if it were, or people from all different walks of life. That's all what it, that's all really what it means in context, okay? Um, we're, we'll get to that as well when we read John chapter 3. So let's continue here at verse 2. This was the first enrollment made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to enroll themselves, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into Judea, excuse me, Judea, to David's city, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and family of David. Okay, now again, I've heard it said before, and one of the objections in some of the Jewish parts of the world, some Jews say that Jesus can't be the Messiah because, because he's not the descendant of David. Well, it says over and over again in the scriptures that he is the descendant of David. In fact, he was called the son of David on numerous occasions, and nobody refuted that. Now, people refuted a lot of things of what Jesus said, but, <laughs> I mean, m miraculously enough, nobody ever refuted that Jesus was the son of David. They all knew it. Verse 5, to enroll himself with Mary, or Miriam would be his, her real name, who was pledged to be married to him as wife, being pregnant. While they, while they were there, the day had come for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son. It's very important that Yeshua was the firstborn. Uh, and so he was the firstborn son. She wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the inn. There were shepherds in the same country, um, staying in the field. 
and keeping watch by night over their flock. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you today in David's city a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This is the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly ar- of the heavenly army praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now let me stop here for a second. And again, th- there is a tendency with a lot of people to read or just to take just a little passage here, a little passage there, a little verse here, a little verse there, a word here, a word there, and not look at it in, in, in the entire context, okay? So yes, when, when Yeshua was born, it says, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, that does not mean that Jesus is just like, just coming just for peace all the time. Like just, he's just like, peace with everybody, peace with everybody. As you read on in his life, he did not make peace with a lot of people. A lot of people were very angry with him. And in fact, one part of the scriptures, it says that he actually said, don't think that, don't think that I've come to bring peace, but I've come to bring a sword to divide between people. I mean, between friends, obviously, and also between family members. There can be one sister and one brother. There can be one mother-in-law and one son-in-law that can be divided against each other. Why? Because of the faith of Jesus, okay? So yes, Jesus didn't come to bring peace in that sense. He came for a sword. It is good to be divided in, in that sense because being holy is what God wants you to be. God calls you over and over and over again to be holy. And being holy means being set apart, being separate, being separated from from the common world, uh, the common man, so to speak, or the world system, so to speak. So Jesus doesn't want you to blend in. He said, wide is the road, wide is the way. Many are on it that are on the road to hell, that are on the road to destruction. It is the the highway to hell is very wide, very easy, and very well traveled. But Jesus said, narrow is the road, narrow is the path that is uh, the path of everlasting life, the path to heaven. And few, Jesus said, few there be that find it. So how do they go on the, on the path uh, to heaven? They have to come out from among them, as it says over and over in the scriptures. You've got to come out from among them, which means you may have family, you may have friends. I'm sure everybody does that are worldly people, earthly people, materialistic people, selfish people, people that are not really serving God in the way they should be serving God. Not really of God, okay? They are more like just the rest of the world. Jesus said, come out from among them. Don't be part of them. Don't be partakers with them. Come out from them. Be separate from them, says the Lord, and I will be your father and you will be my children. So yes, there is separation that needs to take place. There is a sword that needs to cut. Uh, The people that are on the straight and the the narrow uh, are the ones that have to be cut away from the from the broad from the wide path you can't make peace with the with the uh, with the wide path and still be on the narrow path okay so yes uh when jesus was born there there was uh praise to god glory to god in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men but that is peace and goodwill toward men to those who love and serve and obey Jesus the way they're supposed to obey Jesus. The ones who really belong to him will have everlasting peace. Let's continue. Verse 15. When the angels went away from them into the sky, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem, or in the Hebrew would be Bethlehem. 
uh, which means house of bread. Okay, bet uh, or bet is house. Laham uh, is bread. Okay. So let's go to Bethlehem now and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They came with haste and found both Mary, Miriam, and Joseph. And the baby was lying in the feeding trough. When they saw it, they publicized widely the saying which was spoken to them about this child. All who heard it wondered at the things which were spoken to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these sayings, pondering them in her heart. Okay, Here again, we see a very humble woman. Very humble woman, Miriam. She didn't go about proud, boasting, full of pride, saying, oh, look at who I am and my son. No, she humbly kept it to herself. Verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, just as it was told them. When eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Yeshua, or Yahushua, Jesus, which was given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Okay, and some people might say, why or why do you say Yeshua or Yehoshua? Well, that's the Hebrew, the original Hebrew pronunciation. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek. Now, the Greek uh, naming conventions, usually the Greek, uh, in Greek, names are ended with S, okay, with, with the letter S. For example, Mark in the Greek is Marcus. Luke in the, in the Greek is Lucas, okay? Um, so a lot of times names are ended with S or A. Like, for example, we got Noah in the Greek, which is Noe. Um, uh, so uh, in, in the Greek, we got Elijah in the Greek, which is Eli, um, Elias, Okay, so it, it, it ends with S. So, the Yeshua, or Yahushua, in the Greek is Yesus. Okay, we got that ending S because that's the way the Greeks like to just put an S on the end of these a lot of names. Okay, so it would be like Yesu, Yeshua, Yesu, Yesus. Now, uh, in the uh, ancient English, I understand there was no J sound, like as we have J today. The, the letter J was pronounced with a Y, as, as today we would pronounce a, a Y, like Ya, okay? So J would be Ya. So the original Greek, Yesus, became over hundreds of years, Jesus, because that uh, J, uh, um, what would you call it, like, evolved into from being a Ya, Jesus, to Jesus, or Jesus. Now, we got it today, okay? So, um, yeah, so Jesus is a transliteration of Jesus in the Greek, which is another transliteration of Yeshua in the Hebrew. Uh, maybe a little bit confusing, but you see how it kind of went from one language to another to another, which we have today, the modern day pronunciation, Jesus. Verse 22, when the days of their purification, according to the law of Moshe, were fulfilled, uh, they, they, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Okay, so... Verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And that is found here in Exodus chapter 13, verses 2 and 12. Okay, So you see that Miriam and Yosef were people who obeyed the law of God. Okay, um, They did everything right according to the law of God. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said of the law of, of the Lord, a pair of two turtle doves or two young pigeons. And that is in 
Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8. Now let's just look at this for a second, because this is kind of interesting. If you would just go on over here to Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8. Uh, it says, If she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. The priest shall make an, an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Okay? So, what happened here, and this is a, a very interesting piece of evidence here, that Miriam and Yosef weren't, they were not very wealthy people. They could not afford to buy a lamb. Uh, so they had to buy two turtle doves or two young pigeons, uh, according to the Lord. So very interesting thing here. You see, Miriam and Yosef were, if you would call them poor, they were poor people. Uh, they were not very wealthy. Uh, they could not even afford to buy one lamb. Okay. Verse 25. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was, was righteous and devout. A lot of people think, how is it possible for someone to be righteous but, you know, in the, you know, according to the law of God? Well, it is very possible. And I speak about this a lot. If you listen to my videos, you'll hear me talk about that, that a lot. That It is possible to obey all the commandments that God uh, want you to obey and that, that you are able to obey and that you are righteous in that. Uh, we have many, many different, uh, I mean, again, Luke chapter 1, we talked about that. So go back to Luke chapter 1 if you want to know more about that. So this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, Mashiach, okay? The Messiah of Israel. He came in the Spirit into the temple. When the parents brought in the child, Yeshua, that they might do concerning him according to the, the custom of the law, then he received him into his arms and blessed God and said, now you are releasing your servant, Master, according to your word in peace. For my eyes have seen the salvation, your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light for revelation to the, to the nations, and the glory of your people Israel. Okay, so Simeon prayed this, uh, talking about his own death. He was basically, uh, as it says, God showed him that he would not die until he sees the Messiah. And he knew that he saw the Messiah, even though he was just a baby. He knew this was the Messiah. So that's why he said, now you are releasing your servant. In other words, I am, I am ready to die now. You are letting me go. I am going. I'm going to the next life. You are releasing your servant according to your word in peace. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 33. Yosef and his mother were marveling at the things at which, which were spoken concerning him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Miriam, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the falling and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which is spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce, pierce through your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of, of, of a great age, having lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and she had been a widow for about 84 years. Wow. Who didn't depart from the temple, worshiping with fastings and, and petitions night, night and day. Coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who were looking for redemption in Jerusalem. Isn't this, isn't this very awesome, very beautiful? Anna here being a wonderful, wonderful woman of God. A prophetess, it says here. Um, again, going back here to uh, 
verse 36. Uh, she was great of a great age, having uh, lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and and she had been a widow for about 84 years. So she uh, she was married, but very very short time. But then after that. She was a widow for 84 years, so she dedicated herself entirely to God. She did not depart from the temple. She lived there, more or less, worshiping with fastings, okay? Fastings, you say, why do people fast? Well, it's a, it's a, it's an act of denying yourself, denying your own lust, denying your own, your own selfish desires, okay? And, um, and just... Um, and just a time just to show God that you are you are humble and uh, that you deny yourself uh, and that um, uh, that you show God that you're serious about things um, that it's not all about you it's not all about feeding yourself it's about serving God and he's and it says fastings and petitions night and day and petitions being prayers night and day so she prayed continually isn't that a wonderful thing Coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who were looking for the, for redemption in Jerusalem. Verse 39. When they had accomplished all things that, that were according to the Torah of the Lord, the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee for their own city, or to their own city, Nazareth. The child was growing and was becoming strong in spirit. May every one of you who are listening to this grow and become strong in spirit. You don't want to be weak, right? You don't want to be like a little jellyfish. You want to have backbone and you want to be strong in spirit. It says in the scriptures, right, the righteous. What does it mean by the righteous? The righteous are those who obey God, who go by God's rules and guidelines and instructions and laws. The righteous are are as bold as a lion. Why? Because they know they're right with God. That's why we call it righteous. Because they're right. These people are right with God. Righteous. That's why they're so strong. So become strong in spirit. Even as, even as you listen to these teachings, even as you listen to these readings, my prayer is for you to become strong in spirit. You know, uh, as I was just I was just sharing with someone just a little while ago, I I marvel how someone like even like like said, let's say Judas Judas would would be living with Jesus night and day for for they say at least three years could have been longer. He was living with Jesus. He saw the great miracles. He saw him walking on the water. He saw him feeding the 5,000 with just a couple fish. He heard the words of life. He heard the words of the Lord straight from his mouth with the Lord God Almighty, Lord of, and maker and creator of heaven and earth. Yet he was a betrayer. Yet he was a devil. Doesn't that make you... I mean, to me, that just is just beyond understanding how anybody could. could <laughs> I mean, it's like Korah in uh, in Moses' day. You know, Dathan in Moses' day, uh, when you got these people who who saw the great miracles, yet they were evil. How could they still be evil? They had just enough of God to think that they were okay. They had just enough of God to be comfortable, but they did not have enough of God to be on God's side, uh, to be right, to escape the judgment of God. As I was just sharing with somebody not too long ago, Judas himself, before any of you were born, he spent over a thousand years, almost 2,000 years, screaming in torment, no comfort, no comfort. No sleep, no rest, nothing but torment. And he will have that torment forever. Jesus said it would, it would have been better if that man had not even been born. That's a harsh statement, a very harsh statement from the Lord God Almighty. Can't say much more harsh than that. 
It's better that you had not even been born, says Jesus. Being filled with the wisdom, being filled with wisdom. This is Jesus being filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. A lot of people think the grace of God means that you can just go on and keep on sinning, keep on, you can do things that you know is not right, but God has, God is gracious, God understands. God's grace was upon Jesus. Jesus condemned sin left and right and center. He continually condemned hypocrisy and sin. He called people sons of Satan. He called a woman a dog. He called people sons of hell. He said they're on their way to hell. He called people sons of serpents, brood of vipers. He called them whitewashed tombs. You beautiful on the outside. You make everything look good on the outside, but inside you are full of dead, filthy, rotten, stinking flesh. This is the grace of God personified. Verse 41. His parents went every year to Jerusalem at the feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Joseph and his mother didn't know it. Now, it's got to gotta, it's gotta make you wonder, how did Joseph and Miriam not know that Jesus was missing? How did they not know it? Could it, be, could it have been that they were, there were so many with them that somehow they assumed that somebody else was babysitting him? Could it have been that there was such a crowd of people that, that they traveled with? Friends, family, that they didn't know that he was gone? Could it have been that Mary had, Miriam had a lot of children after Jesus was born and she was busy with the youngest ones and thought that one of her other family members was taking care of Yeshua. I know that goes against some of the things that some churches believe, but hey, we got to ask questions. Whatever the case is, we know that he was 12 years old, it says here. And uh, it says that um, in verse 43, that uh, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem and Yosef and Miriam didn't know it. Verse 44, but supposing him to be in the company, here we are, the company, it's a, it had to have been a good amount of people traveling with them. They went a day's journey and they looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. 45, when they didn't find him, now, before I go on here, again, I know that, you know, there are some documents, uh, writings and some church beliefs. Uh, we're, I'm going to get into all this stuff. I'm going to be reading a lot of the different writings. It's extra biblical writings. I mean, it's important for us to understand what documents were written, you know, in, in around the first century. It's, it's important for us to understand this, whether or not even, you know, some of the stuff may not be, uh, you know, accurate what is actually written. However, we need to understand this. Um, if Jesus was Miriam's only child, don't you think that she would have been with, she would have been really close to him? Uh, that she would have been always mindful of him? But if Miriam had lots of other children after that, then that would make it a whole lot more believable of why she would not really miss him uh, for a while because I mean, she was busy with, you know, several different babies. Um you know, several, several different youngsters. Uh, and she thought that Yeshua was with one of the relatives. Um, that would make a whole lot more sense, circumstantially speaking. Okay. We also read as well that Yosef did not know Mary, talking about uh, marital relations, until Jesus was born, which gives you the implication that he did know her marital in marital relations uh, speaking. Uh, after Jesus was born, okay? So let's go by the uh, circumstantial evidence here. Uh, although we do have a New Testament Apocrypha that says otherwise, we do have some evidence that seems to be, uh, that seems to challenge that, okay? Let's be, let's be honest here. 
Verse 45, when they didn't find them, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the middle of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and, and, and his answers. Well, of course, because Yeshua is the word of God in the flesh. In other words, Jesus is the word of God, the scriptures, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, personified in the flesh, okay? He was the human form of the scriptures, okay? We didn't have to, uh, uh, we don't have to read it in the, uh, in the book, so to speak, as much as Jesus is, the, is it. He is it, okay? Now, I know a lot of people, there are some people, uh, very fringe, I would call them fringe Christians, that believe that, oh, all you got to do is just have the Holy Spirit, go by the Spirit and Jesus, you don't need to read the Bible. You need to read the Bible to make sure you're on track. You need to read the Bible to make sure the, belief, the Jesus that you're listening to, so to speak, the voices you're hearing, is actually the real voices of, is actually the real God of the Bible, okay? The real Jesus of the Bible, because there are so many people, so many people who say they hear from God, say they, they hear from the Holy Spirit, say that Jesus speaks to them, and he doesn't. Doesn't. It's their own it's their own spirit. It's their own imagination. It's their own mind. I mean, they need to read the book of Jeremiah. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of things that they say brings reproach upon the name of the Lord. And that is a very serious thing. So, uh, verse 48. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Uh, yeah, like, why would you, why would you just leave, leave us? And, you know, a lot of parents need to say that to their children. Why have you treated us this way? Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I were anxiously looking for you. In other words, didn't you know, don't you care that we were looking for you? Why didn't you tell us that you were going to stay behind? Verse 49. He said to them, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? Verse 50. They didn't understand the saying which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. He was subject to them. That's good. Jesus was, sub even though he was Lord God, you know, he was uh, the great I am, so to speak. Uh, he was the Lord. He was still subject to his parents. And his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Again, she didn't go and tell everybody. She wasn't loose with her lips. She wasn't, you know, a woman of many words. She was a humble woman. She wasn't a proud woman going on speaking a lot of things to a lot of people. She kept all these sayings in her heart. There is a good godly woman right there. Verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So that's, that concludes our reading of Luke chapter 2. And I pray that all of you who hear, that have actually uh, stuck through this whole uh, reading and this whole teaching, that all of you will be increased in wisdom, that the wisdom of God would be just multiplied in you and in stature, and you will have the favor of both God and men. Thanks again for watching.